We return now to the United Kingdom, where Prime Minister Boris Johnson survived a parliamentary vote of no confidence today. William Brangham has more on what that move means for Johnson's ability to lead. Um, now this was seen as the most direct threat yet to Mr. Johnson, a rebuke by his own members for holding these parties while the rest of his nation was in COVID lockdown. Though he survived today's vote, many think he's left in a much weakened position politically. But after the vote today, Johnson vowed to press ahead with the nation's business. Uh, although you may want to focus on me and on politics and on, uh, on Westminster, I think what matters is what we deliver and what we do. And as a result of this uh, decision tonight by the Parliamentary Party, which I welcome, uh, we have a conclusion uh, to something that's been dragging on for far too long, and we have the ability now to unite, deliver, and get on with the people's priorities, and that is what we're going to do. For more on this, we turn to Robin Niblett. He's the director of the international think tank Chatham House. Robin Niblett, welcome back to the News Hour. So uh, the prime minister survives this vote today, but could you help us understand how he got to this precipice in the first place? We've certainly seen politicians in the U.S. violate COVID lockdowns, Democrats and Republicans, and they, and they survive it. Why was this so much more severe for, for Prime Minister Johnson? Well, I think it's, it's a culmination of many items. You will remember that Boris Johnson has always been a divisive figure within the Conservative Party, although he secured them a historically large uh, election victory back at the end of 2019. Uh, he was always a very divisive figure within the party ahead, ahead of it, uh, led to the uh, overthrow or the rejection of uh, Theresa May uh, as the uh, prime minister during the Brexit uh, departure and Brexit process. Um, and the minute it looked like he's been playing fast and loose with the truth, specifically over something that has affected so many uh, people around the United Kingdom as it has in the United States, i.e. the COVID lo lockdowns, where the government specifically had told people to follow laws about social distancing, about not mixing, even in the workplace, to see the prime minister then flouting those laws played into uh, a perception of him, of somebody who not only plays fast and loose with the truth, but somebody who reckons there's some rules for himself and other rules for others, that sort of elitist uh, uh, kind of approach, which can really get the back up of, uh, of British, uh, the British public. Um, this is combined by the fact that people are a bit worried, um, having just returned from a sort of spring break, uh, as we've had over here, a late spring break, uh, a sort of half-term recess for Parliament, people heard when they got back home that the results of what's called the Sue Gray report, a report by a British civil servant that was delayed, um, has really hit home. The fact that the prime minister in the previous uh, police investigation received a fixed penalty notice, it's not a criminal thing, but it is a fine for, for breaking the law. The fact that this happened under his watch and that his apologies have been sort of half-hearted, sort of, I apologize for what happened, rather than apologizing for what he did, I think is really getting under the skin of MPs in particular. So he makes it through this vote, but is he wounded politically? Like, what does the future look like for Boris Johnson? Well, I think he's, he's definitely wounded. This, the, the amount of MPs who voted uh, against him, 148, out of 359. So it was a 211 to 148 turn. That's sort of 59 to 41%. That is a much higher number than I think people expected, and certainly than, than I expected and others expected. There are 173 Conservative members of Parliament who have sort of government-type positions or positions granted by the Prime Minister. So you'd expect him to have at least 175, 173 completely loyal. What it means is that the country can see that the party he leads is divided and that, uh, you know, close to half of it um, uh, is very skeptical of his value as a leader and are worried about the future. So I think this undermines his future uh, agenda. It means that on issues where uh, there are particular parliamentarians who disagree, maybe over this Northern Ireland protocol that's a hangover from the Brexit treaty or over immigration policy or even over tax, uh, he's only got an 80 seat majority. It sounded like a lot. But when you've got 148 members of your own party voting against you, they could use any close vote as a chance to undermine his authority. This storm, of course, is happening right as your nation is celebrating the reign of Queen Elizabeth and this wonderful Jubilee celebration that was happening. But 
anyone couldn't help but notice that because of her health, she was only able to attend some of those events. And we saw the next king, Prince Charles, is going to, was stepping into that role. How is that transition going to be going forward? Well, that transition will go forward, if you see what I mean, when it goes forward. Um, there's a very clear succession process, to state the obvious. Uh, Prince Charles will become uh, the next king. Um, and obviously, there's a succession that runs on past him. I think, however, to stay again, to state the obvious, 70 years is well the longest that the UK has ever had a, a monarch. And so uh, this is a monarch has taken the country through so many changes uh, from a country that really was emerging from, uh, in some cases, the rubble of the Second World War through to an entirely modern, changed, multi-ethnic, multicultural society. Uh, look, Prince Charles has been preparing for this role a long time, but there's no doubt that his capacity to earn the trust of the British public will need to be earned. It won't simply carry over uh, from his mother. Uh, and uh, at a time when people are looking at Britain's role in the world, uh, there's still hangovers of, of the UK and the, and the Queen, uh, the head of state being the head of state of a number of former colonies. People are going to be looking at that role again and questioning whether this critical aspect of British soft power quite has the pull that it had before. Uh, it'll be a difficult transition. Robin Niblett of Chatham House, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.